Hello and welcome to another episode of our mini-series on pipeline survey techniques. Today I'm joined with Neil, an expert in the field and a corrosion enthusiast. Today we're going to be taking a look at another survey, DCVG, which is used to detect and size coating defects. If you're new here, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more episodes like this. Welcome, Neil. I'm hoping that you will help us better understand what DCVG is. So let's dive straight in. Can you tell us what it stands for and why it's so important in pipeline integrity management? Well, DCVG is a real mouthful. It's the Direct Current Voltage Gradient Survey. That's its official title. title. And the DCVG survey measures voltage gradients in the soil. So in order to measure a gradient, you have to have two pickup points. So we have two reference electrodes and you put these reference electrodes some distance apart and measure the potential difference between those two okay. reference electrodes. And you may say, well, what on earth causes a potential difference in the soil? Well, we go back to our fundamental Ohm's law and the cause of a potential difference in a resistor. Bear in mind the soil is one great big three-dimensional resistance, electrical resistance. And in order to get a volt drop or a potential difference across two points in the soil, you have to have current flowing through the soil. So in the pipeline situation, what we're looking at is the cathodic protection current. Because the cathodic protection system works by injecting a current into the pipeline along its full length in order to maintain it negative. So we have current flowing into the pipeline through the interface between the pipeline and the soil. And given a uniform coating, irrespective of how good or bad it is, if it's uniform, you're going to have a uniform current flowing to the pipe. So as you improve the electrical resistance characteristics of the coating, so you get less and less current flow to the pipe. And therefore, the idea is that where there is a defect in the coating, in other words, a piece of bare pipe, you have a localized increase in the current flow to the pipe at that point. And where you get that localized increase, you then can pick up the voltage gradient in the soil that is associated with that current flow. So what we do is impress a current onto the pipeline and we cycle that current on and off. Fairly short on bursts so that when you go out in the field with an instrument and you are measuring the potential in the soil between two locations, we use an, what is called an analog meter. It's an old-fashioned meter with a needle. Okay? And you watch this needle and it flicks like this. And where there is no current flow, there's no flick. So you, you follow the flick. And the location of the defect is then determined by finding the place where you get the highest intensity of this flick and that it is equal in all directions. So if you, you measure the difference by having two electrodes that you put in the ground, hold one in each hand, and to finally locate a defect, what you have is the center point, for want of a better word for the defect, and then you measure the gradient all the way around it, and it should be reasonably uniform towards mm. the center. And that's how you pinpoint the location of a defect. Okay. So the DCVG survey is primarily used to locate pipeline coating defects. Okay. So the pipeline, when it is constructed, the intention of the designer and the installer, one hopes, uh, is to install a pipeline that has no defects. Yes. However, these pipes weigh tons, all right, and they're being handled by cranes and caterpillars and things like that. Prone to scratches uh, and... Yeah, yeah, and not, cat not these caterpillars, you know, the, 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 the uh, bulldozers and side right. booms and so on. So there's a good chance that the coating will get damaged mm. during installation. And probably the most important function of the DCVG immediately after installation is to find where there have been areas of mechanical damage so that they can be repaired so that the pipeline doesn't start off with a compromised coating. How does a DCVG survey differ from a SIP survey? 
Well, the, the DCVG survey is primarily designed to locate and characterize coating defects. It doesn't tell you anything about the condition or the operation of the cathodic protection system. Right. Because it is measuring current in the soil. It's not measuring anything that happens between the pipe and the ground around it. During the DCVG survey, we do take pipeline potential measurements, which are used to characterize the DCVG signals. Because you can imagine that if you have a signal of, say, 2,000 millivolts on the pipeline, you're going, to, you're going to get a far bigger indication at a defect than if you only had a signal of 200 millivolts mm -hmm. on the pipeline. So we have to have that measurement on the pipeline. But that's not the DCVG location mechanism. That data then is used in interpreting the DCVG results to determine how big a defect is. A defect could be you know, relatively small, mm. like the size of a large coin, could be the size of your fingernail. It could be that the contractor missed intentionally or otherwise a field joint in a pipeline. Fortunately, we very rarely find contractors that intentionally miss field joints. Thankfully. Yes. And that, that's a really big defect. Mm. Now, how would a DCVG operator collect data in the field? Well, he doesn't. Because when you're walking along the pipeline taking the voltage gradient measurements, where there is no indication on the meter, mm. there is no defect in the vicinity, and no data is collected. Right. So the only data that he may be collecting is if he's using an instrument that has a a real-time GPS function okay. so that it plots his position. The only data he collects is when he actually finds a defect. a defect. And even then, the primary data he collects is the position of the defect. Okay. And the secondary data that he collects then is the potential of the pipe at that point, if he can, depends on what type of DCVG equipment he has with him. Or he has to know his position relative to known test points where you can get pipeline potential readings. Mm. And then he measures the potential over the pipeline or the shift in potential over the pipeline with respect to some distance away at a point what we call remote earth, which is not a physical place. It is a, an area where you get to where there is no further change in the measured potential. Okay. How does DCVG surveys determine the size of a defect? Well, it's, it's really just by a ratio. You need to know the intensity of the gradient at the defect. That's what we've just measured by measuring with respect to remote mm -hmm. earth. And you need to know the intensity of the shift or the signal on the pipeline, which is determined by measuring the pipeline potential at two adjacent test points and taking a, an interpolation between them, or by using a trailing cable and measuring it at that point. Okay. And you then work out the ratio of those two factors based on the, the fact that you've got this shifting potential. Okay. So the bottom line is that you get a, a thing that is called the percentage IR factor. Okay. That is what is generally used in DCVG surveys. So it stands for, again, IR from Ohm's law, current times resistance, mm -hmm. in other words, the voltage. And it is, it is recording the intensity of the gradient as a function of the shift on the pipeline. Right. The greater the percentage IR, the bigger the defect. The problem with that is that there is no universal relationship between percentage IR and defect size. It is particular or peculiar to each pipeline situation. So when you do a DCVG survey and you get a range of data, we know what we know just from experience that if you have a percentage IR of greater than five on a newly constructed pipeline, that is a definitely a defect that needs to be investigated. Right. Okay. If defects are less than 1% on a new pipeline, and I, I repeat that, there's an emphasize on a new pipeline, it's likely that that defect is insignificant and will be catered for by the cathodic protection system. Okay. And in between that, you've then got to excavate a number of defects to characterize a pipeline. 
right. and decide, it's up to the, the engineers then to decide what size of defect they're going to accept. And then the contractor will be required to excavate and repair all the defects that are um, larger than whatever that value is. So you've mentioned that a DCVG survey can help you determine the size of a defect. Yes. But what about the shape or location? Can it help you identify that? Well, to a certain extent, yes. So you wouldn't be able to tell whether a defect was round like a soccer ball or oval like a rugby ball because the, the gradient that you measure is not that precise. Okay. But if you had a long linear defect like a scratch, for example, you would be able to determine that by the nature of the pattern of the, um, gradient. the gradient okay. that you measure. Also, if the defect is on top of the pipeline, you'll get a very sharp gradient. If the defect is underneath the pipeline, you'll get quite a diverse or a diffuse gradient. If the defect is on the side of the pipeline, the defect center point will be offset from the pipeline center line. Right, yeah. okay. So it's the sort of information that you can pick up. Okay, yeah. cool. Now, can you explain some challenges of DCVG on a pipeline that has sacrificial anode cathodic protection? Well, one of the challenges, of course, is that the sacrificial anodes may be directly connected to the pipeline. Okay. In other words, it's not possible to disconnect the anode during a survey. In that case, every anode is going to show up as a defect. Depending on whether the anodes are buried close to the pipeline or with the usual cases that the anodes are buried about three meters away from a pipeline at the edge of a servitude, in that situation, you'll pick up these anodes and these anode gradients may be so intense that they mask defects that are on the pipeline itself. Okay. So that is a challenge in, in interpretation. Also, if the anodes are connected through test stations where you can disconnect them, it's a lot of work to go ahead and disconnect all yeah, the anodes before you start imagine. doing the survey and then reconnecting them afterwards. One of the bigger challenges that we face with sacrificial anodes is when the system, the pipeline system, has been equipped with long linear anodes. So in AC mitigation situations and in some cathodic protection situations, we are now using zinc ribbon electrodes. Okay. When these ribbons may be up to 100, 200 meters long. And in that situation, you've got this continuous defect parallel to the pipeline, which almost entirely masks any defects that you might have in the coating of the pipe. So ideally, sacrificial anodes should be installed in such a way that they can be disconnected for a DCVG survey. Or I suppose the operator should know the location of the anodes. Would that be helpful? Uh, yes. Yeah. He's going to find them anyway, <laughs> even if he doesn't know where they are. No, the, the problem is that the gradient from the anode may well overshadow a gradient from a small defect on the pipeline. Okay. Now, how does the misinterpretation of a DCVG survey lead to an incorrect assessment of pipeline integrity? Well, one of the big challenges that we have seen is that the characteristics of pipeline coatings change with time. So as the coatings absorb moisture, which they will do, they become more electrically conductive and uh, there's a characteristic known as the spread resistance, which is a, a name that is used to describe the contact resistance between a defect on the pipeline surface and the ground okay. in general. And the spread resistance generally decreases with time, even with cathodic protection. So a defect may not increase in size at all, but its spread resistance will decrease. Okay. Yeah. So if you do a survey on an aged pipeline, so a pipeline that had been in the field for several years, you're going to find a completely different set of criteria in terms of what is a significant defect. So we had a pipeline where it was a very useful um, exercise. We had been involved in the construction of the line. We had a DCVG survey done immediately after installation, and there were a number of defects. And the larger ones then got repaired, but the smaller ones did not. We then did a survey again five years later, and 
we were able to find the same locations, but the percentage IRs were now an order of magnitude larger. So instead of something being 1.5%, it was now 15%. Now, for on a new pipeline, a 15% defect would mean an unwrapped joint or something yeah. like that. Whereas when we excavated a couple of these defects, we found that they had not increased in size at all. Sure. Yeah. So it helps to know a little bit about the pipeline. You, you, you have to know that. And, and that is why it is so important that for any survey, you've either got to compare back to previous surveys mm. or you have to do what we call calibration digs. Okay. So you, you choose a number of different indications, excavate them and find out what do these mean for this pipeline at this point in time. Okay. Yeah. Now, can environmental factors impact the accuracy of your results? Not really. The resistivity of the soil, which gives rise to the R in the IR okay. factor, changes. Okay. Okay. Um, it can change with rain, climatic conditions, temperature, and so on. But in terms of, of physically locating defects, your environmental factors don't really play a part. Okay. may make it in very, very dry conditions. It is more difficult to find the defects because you have much lower currents flowing. Right. But other than that, not really. Okay. Because the environmental factor of the actual resistivity of the soil at the time of the survey is taken into account in that ratio that is determined because the same environmental factor applies to both the pipeline shift and the gradient shift. Right. Now, if your results show multiple defects, how would you go about deciding which ones you need to repair immediately and which ones you can take a little while to get to? Well, there, that goes back to the, the requirement to do calibration excavations. Okay. So you would choose a number of typical sizes and perhaps also typical locations and excavate those and decide which of those are relevant and which are not. And then once you've established a, a level of relevance, then anything larger than that would then be something that needs to be repaired. An interesting point, though, is that if you're in an AC interference situation, the relevance of the size actually goes in the opposite direction. Smaller defects are more dangerous. Okay. Well, I think that this wraps up our conversation on DCVG surveys. And I think it's pretty clear that it's quite an important technique in locating and sizing your defects on your pipeline. So thanks for sharing and thanks for your time. And to those listening, if you are interested in any more pipeline survey techniques, why don't you subscribe and stay tuned for more videos like this. Thank you.